So, so Ireland, Yugoslavia, and Italian prisoner in Libya. Man, future sounds adventurous. Okay. April 27th, 1940. Over two weeks ago, Germany invaded Norway. Last week, the British and French began sending in men to help the Norwegians fight the Germans. And this week, this week comes the Allied order for evacuation. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, German forces began branching out inland from the major ports of Norway, which they took two weeks ago when their invasion of Norway began. The Allies had begun landing forces to oppose the Germans, but already in the first few days they fared poorly, as their expedition had been hastily cobbled together. And things continue to go well for the Germans this week as well. At the week's beginning on the 21st, Norwegian forces are pushed out of Lillehammer by Germans coming from both sides of Lake Mjøsa. That day sees the first fighting between Germans and the British 148th Brigade east of the lake, and it does not go well for the British. The next day at Tretten, two British battalions take on three German ones that have air, artillery, and armor support. This is a key position, and it gives access to Gudbrand's Dahl. The British light anti-tank guns are ineffective against the German armor, though, and what is left of the British force after the fight, 300 men, retreat north. Each day, the first half of the week actually, the 148th are forced to retreat north of Lillehammer by the German advance up the Gudbrandsdal. Now, the night of the 23rd, the 15th Brigade lands at Molde and Andalsnes and heads to relieve them. By the 24th, as the Germans reach Rendalen and over the remainder of the week, General Paget and the 15th engage the Germans in Gudbrandsdal. His 3,000 men, without vehicles, artillery, armor, and air cover, faced German mechanized troops well-equipped with tanks and artillery and with complete control of the air. That sounds daunting. But the British and Norwegians held the Germans off repeatedly at Kvam, and to quote French historian Francois Kersodi, himself quoted in Hitler's Arctic War, for the first time since the British landed in Norway, this was a real battle, not an execution. Several sources confirm the quality of the British defenses there. But you can't even really be sure they were supposed to be there. The 148th, for example, had defied London's instructions by going and actually offering actual direct combat support to the Norwegians. But they couldn't contain the whole advance without air cover or reinforcements, and they made a fighting retreat. Paget requested such necessities from the British War Office, but will be told to his considerable surprise, that the British and French are to evacuate central Norway. Yep, at the end of the week, the British decide they will evacuate Namsos and Andalsnes, which means ending all attempts to reach Trondheim. See, on the 27th, the German bombers blitz Namsos, attacking the freighters trying to land supplies. The Germans have total air superiority in central Norway. The experience in Norway clearly demonstrated the fallacy of the views of some leading Royal Naval officers that carrier fighter cover was an optional extra. Literally overnight, it brought the realization to most that the fleet would find it impossible to operate in a hostile environment. But the Royal Navy continued to suffer from the legacy of neglect of naval aviation during the interwar period, lacking sufficient large carriers and, in particular, effective carrier-based fighters. Norway's nearest coastline from Britain is 400 miles away. That's too far away for land-based air cover. Thing is, at Trondheim, the Germans are not in a good state. They have 4,000 men there thanks to airlifts, but not much artillery or really equipment in general. Still, the British cannot take advantage of this. The Luftwaffe shell Namsos regularly, and British General Carton de Viart's port is a complete wreck. He's the Anglo-French commander there. But his men cannot make it to Trondheim that easily or quickly since the roads are full of snow. He's even been told by the aide he'd sent to London for instruction to do whatever he wants because high command does not know what they want done. A side note on Adrian Carton de Viart here. He is one of the most interesting military figures of any army ever. And you should look him up and read all about him. At this point, he's a few days shy of his 60th birthday, and he's been a fighting man the whole 20th century, seeing action in the Second Boer War and World War I. He was born in Belgium, and there are many who believe him 
an illegitimate son of King Leopold. He didn't actually become a British citizen until his mid-twenties, and that was years after he left Oxford to fight for the British in the Boer War. He was wounded twice and sent home, though he did return to the fight. When World War I broke out, he first fought the forces of the Mad Mullah in British Somaliland, losing an eye, and yes, here in Norway, he still wears a pirate eye patch. He then fought on the Western Front and was wounded a total of seven times there, including being shot through the skull, the leg, the ankle, the hip, and the ear, losing his left hand, and supposedly pulling off his own fingers when a doctor refused to amputate them. Needless to say, he won loads of medals and awards for his service. Post-war, he led the British mission to Poland, where, yes... He saw more adventure, even action against the Soviet Red Army, and time as a captive in Lithuania. He remained, retired, in Poland during the interwar years until the summer of 1939, when he took up his post as head of the British mission again, was evacuated to Romania during the invasion of Poland, and escaped from there with a false passport. And he is now in charge of this hastily assembled force tasked with liberating Trondheim but his adventures are still far from over. But they are nearly over in Norway. The Germans take Steinkjer to the north of Trondheim the 22nd. De Viart orders his men back to Namsos, and the whole British operation in central Norway is a ruin. An attack on Trondheim is no longer possible. So there's no point sitting around Namsos being bombed. The 148th is in worse trouble to the south, since the Germans are threatening to outflank them from Osterdal. French reinforcements do arrive for De Viart, and finally carrier-based British aircraft are in the skies. Though not that many, they do at least seriously help morale. The French and Norwegians make plans to attack Steinkjer, but De Viart thinks the whole situation untenable and turns down extra troops because it will only be that many more men to evacuate. The situation is different, though, in the north of Norway. The British have total naval dominance there since they are mostly out of reach of German aircraft, and British aircraft can fly from Bar du Foss airfield. British, French, and Polish troops have landed and are well established around Narvik, which the Germans occupied. And the Allies also have the Norwegian 6th Division fighting with them, the only fully mobilized Norwegian division. They are all preparing to retake Narvik and have been making probing attacks for two weeks now. Adolf Hitler is quite worried about the Narvik situation. Remember, the port of Narvik has been Germany's conduit for the iron ore from Yalavari in Sweden that they need for their war effort. The British bombard it to try and get the German garrison to just surrender using the battleship Warspit, a heavy cruiser, and three light cruisers. This is unsuccessful. The guy in charge here is Admiral of the Fleet Lord Cork. Winston Churchill brought him back to active service, but there are issues. He has seniority over the commander of the whole home fleet, Admiral Sir Charles Forbes, but is actively using the fleet's ships. So his seniority poses a problem for other military commanders who are reluctant to insist on actions because of that seniority. Churchill and company have not really clarified how this will all work. It is hard to exaggerate the chaos of the Allies' decision-making or the cynicism of their treatments of the hapless Norwegians. The British government made extravagant promises of aid, while knowing that it lacked the means to fulfill them. Meetings in London often degenerate into screaming matches. Commanders do not coordinate with one another. By this time, and even with plenty of boots on the ground, six different plans for overall operations have been thrown out. But the ministers and the high command know that even if defending Norway is futile militarily, it is necessary politically. The French arrived the 27th in London for another meeting of the Supreme War Council, and they are pretty stunned by British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain and company's sudden proposal to quit the fight in Norway and evacuate. They are very much opposed to this and return to Paris with French Prime Minister Paul Reynaud thinking he has convinced the British to change their minds. Two hours later, the British give the order to evacuate. Waino calls the ministry old men who do not know how to take a risk. If you're wondering, yes, this does produce a lot of animosity and mistrust between the British and French high commands. But if their leadership can be chaotic, that of occupied Norway is becoming more ordered. Last week, an administrative council chaired by Ingolf Christensen took over from Vidkun Quisling's cabinet 
just days after his coup. This week on the 24th, Joseph Terboven, a Nazi party official, is appointed Reichskommissar of Norway, giving him effective control. Though he will really only have a supervisory authority, and the administrative council will run the daily affairs of the country. He also does not have authority over the armed forces stationed there. They are still under General Falkenhorst. And the week comes to an end, a week of fighting in central Norway that culminates with the decision to evacuate the region as the death toll is in the thousands and continued action seems futile, even as allied forces consolidate in the far north. I know this episode paints the British High Command as ineffective or incompetent. But it isn't really all of them, just a few prominent ones who are causing the chaos. And considering they had this Norway thing thrust upon them, it's not entirely fair to blame them for planning and organizational problems that ruin operations. But you can blame them for this. Something I did not mention about the evacuation order from the British powers that be. British local commanders are instructed not to tell the Norwegians that they are leaving. They are simply to leave. If you'd like to see more about the situation in other occupied nations, you can check out the April episode of our War Against Humanity series right here. Our Patreon supporter of the week is Modestas Pesiocas. Cool name. His and our other patron support on Patreon is what pretty much entirely finances this series. So if you enjoy what you see, help us out and join our Time Ghost army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com. Don't forget to subscribe. See you next time. Mm-hmm.